So we've been talking about the major wartime conferences between the big three uh, allies that happened during World War II. Uh, most of those conferences were focused on st uh, strategy for how to defeat the Axis powers, but an ongoing conversation that all of these countries were having at the same time, especially once it became clear that uh, the Allies were going to achieve victory, is what the post-war world would look like. And one of the things that these three countries, eventually four countries, were talking about was the, the organization of, or the, the formation of an organization that would maintain international peace. That organization is called, as we know it today, the United Nations. So we're going to take a look at some of the key evolutions that happened throughout that process. We're going to look at the flaws of the League of Nations. So we're going to back up the clock to the end of World War I and talk about uh, an organization that predated the United Nations called the League of Nations. And then we'll look at the origin of how this group was formed, uh, eventually how it was established and brought into being, and the organizational structure of the organization itself, the United Nations. So let's back up to the end of World War I very quickly, and let's just recall that the United States president at the time was Woodrow Wilson, and he wrote a document called the 14 Points. The big takeaway from that document was that he believed that there needed to be an international organization that was formed in order to allow the countries of the world to mediate their disputes and to hopefully uh, prevent the kind of carnage and destruction that had happened uh, during World War I. Of course, if, if you are familiar with the timeline, you know that, relatively speaking, it was a short amount of time between the end of World War I and the beginning of World War II. So clearly, the League of Nations, which had been designed in order to prevent a world war from happening again, didn't work. If it had, we wouldn't have had a World War II. There were primarily three main problems with the League of Nations as it was organized. The first problem was that the three most powerful countries in the world at the time were not members of the organization. The USA, even though the, the American president, President Wilson, had proposed the idea, the United States Congress, uh, according to the laws of the United States, had to approve the United States membership, and most people in the United States did not want to be part of an, an international organization. Even though the US had fought during World War I or sent some troops over, to assist the French in, in, in defeating the Germans, uh, the United States wanted to maintain an isolationist policy. They didn't, most people in the United States at the time, didn't think that anything in Europe was the business of the United States and that they should just stay out of it. Secondly, we had the Russians, and of course the Russians were communists at the time because this was after the Russian Revolution. They hated Britain and they hated France. They did not want to be part of any organization uh, that included Britain and France. So you have the United States, not part of the League of Nations. You have the Soviet Union, not part of the League of Nations. And you have Germany. And Germany wasn't allowed to be part of the United Nations because that was one of the conditions uh, under the Treaty of Versailles that they were forced to sign after their defeat during World War I. So the first problem was three very powerful countries, none of them are participating in the League of Nations. The second problem was the structure of the organization itself. In order to get anything done, you had to have a unanimous vote of all of the members of the council. Uh, and as you might imagine, it's very difficult to get countries of the world to agree, especially in a unanimous fashion, on anything. Right? So oftentimes there would be a crisis, and the League of Nations, because of the way that it was structured, was unable uh, or didn't have the power to do anything about whatever the problem was. Finally, and this is probably the biggest problem with the League of Nations, was that it was created out of the Treaty of Versailles. And everybody hated the Treaty of Versailles. The Germans hated the Treaty of Versailles. The Americans hated the Treaty of Versailles. So anything that had been associated with the Treaty of Versailles was sort of poisonous. And that's probably the biggest reason that the League of Nations was unable to be successful in what it was designed to do. So with the understanding that we're fast forwarding ahead just a little bit to the beginning of World War II, let's look at the origins of the United Nations. And probably the first thing we need to look at is the Atlantic Charter. 
which happened in August of 1941. This was a bilateral document. That means that there were only two sides that agreed, but these were two important sides. This was the United Kingdom under Winston Churchill and the United States under the president at the time, Franklin Roosevelt. It was just a general statement of agreement. Um, and they agreed that there should be, in principle, the freedom for, for countries to navigate the seas and to not have their ships be attacked, that there should be some organization to deal with international justice and to resolve disputes that happened between countries, that there should be safety within borders, that, that countries should be free, to, uh, to, free from attack from outside countries and, and be safe, and they believed that there should be some sort of economic collaboration um, between countries. So again, the Atlantic Charter was a general statement of principles, uh, nothing formal yet, but it's important to note that two of the important people in this process, or two of the important countries in this process, are already talking about the need for some sort of greater cooperation. Then you had the Moscow Conference in 1943. Uh, again, there's a general statement that comes out of the Moscow Conference in 1943. Moscow 1943, again, was another general agreement. We weren't getting too specific yet. Uh, we were talking about other things besides an international organization. We were talking about the Allies uh, fighting in the Axis powers, uh, the unconditional surrender that would be required by the Axis powers. But the important takeaway from the Moscow conference is that we now weren't just talking about the United States and the United Kingdom, that the Moscow conference also included the Soviet Union and China. And they sign a declaration at the end of this conference, the Moscow Declaration. And the big takeaway that you should know with that document is that they are calling for the establishment of an international organization based on the principle of sovereign equality of all peace-loving states. And they are saying that anybody uh, should be allowed to be a member of that international organization. So as you can see, we started with the Atlantic Charter. We have two sides talking. Sort of momentum is building by 1943, and we now have the United Kingdom, the United States, the Soviet Union, and China. So now we get sort of more formal with the establishment. Now that these four major countries have decided that there should be an international organization established, there's going to be a major meeting that happens in the United States. It's the Dumberton Oaks Conference. Dumberton Oaks is a suburb of Washington, D.C. And this is the point in which China, Great Britain, the United States, and the Soviet Union meet to discuss the details. So we're going from a general idea to more formally sitting down and negotiating exactly what this international organization is going to look like. Major agreements that come out of this are the overall structure of the United Nations and uh, the idea that there will be peacekeeping forces, international military forces that will be available to this, to this organization in order to maintain the peace. But that brings us to the last of the two major World War II conferences, or the first of the last two major World War II conferences, and that's the Yalta Conference. Of course, that takes place in February 1945. And the major outstanding issue uh, because most agreement has been reached on what the United Nations is going to look like, but there's going to be this issue about the Security Council of the United Nations and what voting procedure looks like for the Security Council. In short, what has been decided is that the United Nations is going to include all of the countries of the world, and that, that group of countries is going to be called the General Assembly. Every country gets one vote. Uh, however, uh, there is also the establishment of what is called the Security Council. And the Security Council was made up of five countries. Four of them you've already heard. It's United States, Soviet Union, Great Britain, China, and France is going to be added to that group of five. And those five countries are going to be permanent members of what is called the Security Council. There are also 11 other members that are part of the Security Council on a rotating basis. The important takeaway from the Security Council is that those five countries, they have the right to veto anything that's passed by the United Nations. Okay, So anything that's passed has to go through the Security Council, any major decision. 
and the members of the Security Council, any one of them, or any group of them, group of those five together, any one of them has the right to veto something. So essentially what you have is, is the situation where you have a democratic organization that's made up of all the countries of the, of the world, but it's clear that there are five countries who are going to have more power than anyone. I'm going to fast forward through my next slide because I got a little bit ahead of myself. But again, the General Assembly is made up of all member states. The Security Council has 11 members. Five of them are permanent members, like I just said. Also within the United Nations, there is established an International Court of Justice. That's the arm of the United Nations that is sort of decided uh, that will settle or arbitrate international disputes between countries. So what are the key takeaways that you should, you should have from all of this? Well, the first one is that there was widespread agreement among most countries that the League of Nations was lacking. There were inherent problems with the League of Nations. And I hope you picked up on the fact that several of the decisions that were made about what the United Nations should look like seek to address what those deficiencies were in the United Nations. Uh, early on, and it's important to notice that this, this was an evolving process, but fairly early on, going all the way back to the Atlantic Charter, there was consensus that there would be some, there would need to be some sort of organization created. And we see that sort of progress from uh, the, the Atlantic Charter through the Moscow uh, Conference, uh, uh, through the, the Dumberton Oaks Conference, and then all the way up through Yalta. This is an ongoing con uh, conversation that these countries are having. And finally, and this is one of the important takeaways, especially as we look forward to the Cold War, there was uh, arguing among the United States and the Soviet Union. Uh, well, the United States and other Western countries. But there was some arguing about what the balance of power within the Security Council would look like. And what you need to know is that the, the Soviet Union was attempting to sort of stack the deck in their favor, and they were trying to uh, say that all of their republics should be, should be part of the United Nations. That would sort of increase their membership because the Soviet Union wasn't just Russia. It was Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, uh, Turkmenistan, Azerbaijan, Armenia, the Baltic states, which had been annexed. And they wanted each of those republics even though they were part of the larger USSR, they wanted each of those republics to have membership in the UN and be granted a vote. Of course, that would tip the scales of balance and their power. At the same time, there were some, uh, some arguments among some of the smaller and less powerful countries that this idea of one country on the Security Council having veto power tipped the balance of power too much in favor of those large, powerful five countries. So those are the sort of the takeaways that, that I think you need as we look forward to moving into the next phase of the Cold War. And of course, one more point to add is that although the United Nations is a democratic organization, the power certainly is, or was, and probably is, most people would say, uh, does continue to be centered within the Security Council.